Okay, so um, at the outset, uh, let me thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to join any activity of the SLM. And it's a double pleasure when it um, is to talk about how we can obtain ethics approval without delays, especially as I'm part of the SLMA's Ethics Review Committee. So um, if I actually can finish in just one, a couple of sentences, I would say, if you do exactly what Pujita said, there would be minimal delays. But uh, since I do have another 25 minutes, let me take you through the issues that we have come across and see how we can avoid these delays when we submit a protocol to ethics approval. So, um, right. So I'm going to confine my talk to human research, but bear in mind that any of you who are out there who's doing research involving animals, there are two you will need to get ethics approval from an appro appropriate ethics review committee. So I'm just going to talk about research that involves humans. And for most of us who are clinicians, I'd like to draw your attention to this distinction that research is not medical care. And for most of us, medical care is just second nature. We think of us as doctors and the people we see as patients and we give them the best possible care that we can in whatever the circumstance that we have. But take it away from us and put on a hat which a researcher would use. And so therefore, then you suddenly become a researcher who's looking for answers. And instead of patients, you are now faced with study participants or study subjects. And there's a huge difference between the two. With the doctor-patient relationship, it's actually the patients who come to us. Whereas in this other relationship where we become researchers, we are inviting people to come into a research. And there is a difference. And I'll highlight that a little bit later as we go on. The second point that I'd like to draw your attention to is that ERC, obtaining the ERC approval is not necessarily addressing ethical issues in a study or in a study protocol. There are two vastly different things. And we will look at those as we go on. So what I'm hoping to do is to take you through why we need ethics in research. Of course, one's supposed to publish, but there is a lot beyond that. How do we select the most appropriate ethics review committee for our studies? And what is needed from us as applicants if you're applying for the ethics review committee? And look at what the ERC will do when they receive this uh, protocol. So all of these are important if we are to avoid delays. So as you know, by now, research offers us a way of developing information that is not otherwise obtainable. Not otherwise obtainable is important because particularly if you are doing Me Too studies, it's very important to justify why this Me Too study is being done because that information is already available. Let me give you an example, because sometimes we get studies saying, I want to look at the patient profile of patients admitted with dengue or COVID to this hospital and or to the other hospital. Now, we do know the profile of most of these patients sometimes. So it, the protocol then needs to tell us how does this population of patients differ from the others that we already know about? Why is this hospital different to the other? Why can't it be a general thing? So it's very important that we find some information that we are looking at finding information that is not otherwise obtainable. So obviously research will involve humans and animals. And because it's research and because we are trying to answer a question to which we do not know what the answer is going to be, there is always an element of uncertainty. And with that uncertainty, there is an element of risks as well. And therefore, we need ethics to protect participants and also the researchers, because the researchers also need some protection to say that they are doing the right thing by the participants. So it's important that we have ethics to do both these things. And the conduct of research is ethical if it will contribute valuable and relevant knowledge that promotes the health and well-being of people. So how do we then avoid delays with ethics approval? Because I think that's something that all of you would have encountered. You get your protocol, you have your details, you have the documents, you send it to the ethics, and then there are delays. 
So how can we avoid these delays and get our approval as quickly as possible? So the first thing that you need to do, I think Pujita highlighted that as well, you need to plan your study. Particularly, you need to bear in mind the time frame or the limit that you have set to get these approvals. So these are processes that take time and you need to give that time, to bear in mind that time uh, when you plan for, uh, for applications and when you plan the study. So you can't actually send the protocol and expect immediate approval, that never happens. So it's good to know how much time you have and plan in advance to get these approvals so that you will not be delayed unnecessarily. Uh, so obviously then if your protocol is complete and well prepared, there would be minimal delays in an ethics review process. You need to select the appropriate ethics review committee. It's very important to look at the oversight of that ethics review committee. Now in Sri Lanka, we have hospital ethics review committees, university ethics review committees, the national level ethics review committees like the SLMA. So what sort of an oversight does that ethics review committee have? Because some of them will not be able to give you approval for studies that are done in different sites. Then similarly, some of the faculty ERCs might say, okay, uh, we are going to review protocols only from these applicants or only for studies that are done in these particular study sites. So that's something you need to be aware of. Then of course, the type of research, if it's a clinical trial that can be approved only by selected ethics review committees in Sri Lanka, and it's very important that you know what they are. It's only by doing and selecting this appropriate ethics review committee that you can get the best out of the review process as well as get the relevant approval that you need. So when you're preparing the application, check what the ERC wants, that particular ethics review committee wants. So go to their website, check their application. Most of the ERCs now have a common application format, which makes things easier. If you have to apply for multiple ethics review committees, sometimes you do. So therefore check their application and see what they want. If it's a postgraduate research study, get the border study or the graduate studies approval letter because without that approval, very few ethics review committees will review your application. Uh, then the detailed protocol, all what Prof. Pujita said should be there in that protocol, whatever that is relevant. And the other supporting documents, your research tools, which may be questionnaires or data extraction sheets, the informed consent forms, they are relevant translations. That's very important. These need to be submitted. The relevant translations are important because we want to see how we are going to communicate whatever you want to communicate to the study participants. So it has to be in English, obviously, because that's the master document. But over and above that, you need to give that document in Sinhala and Tamil because those are the two languages that we have. Now, you can't say I can translate as you go, as we go on, because that's not acceptable because two people will translate the same document in a different way. So the exact translations should be submitted to the ethics review committee with that application. So I mentioned about the ethics review, the oversight of the ERC. The more important one for medical research that we do is whether a major ERC's approval will be accepted by the hospital or whether you will need to go for the hospital ethics review committee's approval as well. Now, some of these ethics review committees have mutual understandings, like some of the major teaching hospitals would say, okay, if you have approval from one of the faculties that are affiliated with us, then we will only go for administrative clearance. Or sometimes they might say, that's immaterial, you need to go through our ethics review committee as well. So know what they want. And as I said, select the most appropriate ethics review committee or the ethics review committees for your study and submit a complete application. And all these documents should be very well prepared. So once you submit that application, sometimes there would be a payment involved. You need to make that payment as well. And the payment will depend on the ethics review committee because if it's a university affiliated one, and you're a member of that university, sometimes there may not be any charge or you might have to pay a very nominal charge. Then sometimes the fee might vary depending on whether it is a sponsored study or not. That will also have various grades depending on who's funding the study. Now, when it comes to the ERC, 
they will be looking at the justification for the study and how you are going to do that study. So we will be looking at the scientific validity and the social value of that protocol. So we will be looking at the title and see whether that is compatible with the general and the specific objectives. And we we'll look at the justification for doing that study, either in the country or in the community or in that particular hospital. So the ERC will also look at the methodology and we'll see whether that methodology is able to meet the objectives that you have given. Now, one of the questions that lots of us uh, people will be asking us is, why should the ERC review the scientific part of the protocol? Because all what I said earlier is actually the scientific part of that protocol. Now, a protocol needs a review. If we have a very good independent board that will look at the scientific part of it, then the ethics review committees actually don't need to look at the science of it. But in Sri Lanka, we have very few such instances. So the only time where this protocol will undergo a review would be at the ethics review committee. So the ethics review committee will also then look at the scientific part of the protocol and they will also have adequate expertise to review that protocol, the science of it, not only the ethics. So they will have enough people to review the science of it. And if they do not have enough people, they have the facility to get experts to comment on the scientific aspect of that protocol. So that is one place where your protocol will actually undergo a detailed review for the scientific requirements as well. And as you can see, the scientific requirements are very important because unless we have a very robust study protocol, the information that you get out of it will not be valid and you might not be able to generalize it to the rest of the population. So then the findings would have very minimal use and you would have actually put people or even animals through a procedure for no purpose. So it's very important that the science of that protocol is extremely sound. Looking at the ethics, there are four basic principles. There's beneficence, that is benefit. Non-maleficence, that's no harm. Then the respect of for persons or what is called autonomy and justice. So in the protocol, all these four need to be addressed. It is not only the risks and benefits. Risks and benefits need to be addressed. So in the protocol, the, review, the researcher should say how what the risks are and how they are going to minimize those risks. If there is uh, no benefit, there shouldn't be any harm anyway. Then how are you going to look at the autonomy of the person? How are you going to allow for their, um, look at how you are going to uh, protect their rights, uh, may, uh, support, uh, maintain their privacy and confidentiality? all those things and of course justice is how we select participants are you favoring one group or are you burdening one group are you uh, going to the same population repeatedly because it's a captive population so all these things will need to be discussed in the protocol so if that protocol comes to the ethics review committee they will decide whether it's going for a full board expedited accelerated or exempted. These mean different things. Full board is that you have the entire ethics review committee sitting and looking at the protocol, which takes time. Expedited is when the risk is not more than minimal risk. You can have an accel uh, you can have an, a quicker review uh, with a smaller number of people. Accelerated is what we have been doing over the last one and a half years, particularly when it came to COVID related research because the delay would have cost a lot of things. So it is a full board review, but we do it faster and sooner than what would happen normally. Exempted is if there is no risk involved, the ethics review committee will exempt it from review, but give the researchers a letter saying that it has been exempted. And once they do that, they will give a decision, which would be either to accept it as it is, but I would say that's extremely rare to get your protocol accepted without any comments in the first instance. You might be asked to do minor changes or major changes. Major changes would mean that you're practically rewriting the entire part of the protocol. Or if it is totally unscientific or unethical, there might be rejection in that current form. And what are you going to do with that research? Uh, the decision of the ERC is up to you. You could, of course, submit it back with the modifications that the Ethics Review Committee requests, and they will look at it and give you a decision. If 
they have rejected you could also appeal against that decision so that's important there is a way of appealing if against an ERC's decision and that can be utilized by the researchers as they want now uh, the time frame is important you will be given a timeline to meet if you meet that timeline then the review becomes faster if you don't meet that timeline, then with the resubmissions, the review gets longer and longer. Um, ERCs actually do not give special privileges. So it doesn't matter whether you are a senior researcher or a junior researcher, it's treated in the same way because it's, it's not an anonymous uh, review because we look at the researchers' qualifications, they are training to see whether they are qualified enough to do the study, whether the team has enough expertise to do that study, but it doesn't really matter whether you are a senior person or a junior person, the ERC is really not uh, worried about it. So um, plan to give the ERC at least three months for review. Of course, that will depend on the quality of the protocol and the other documents that have been submitted. Uh, remember, if it is incomplete, you might actually not be able to get it to the ERC office even. And even if the ERC office accepts it, it might not be reviewed by the ethics review committee because the documents will be looked for, uh, will be checked for completeness by the secretary of the ERC usually. And if any of the documents are not there, then you will get the protocol back for asking you to complete it. So there is always, it's always good to look at the checklist that the ERCs normally share with the, uh, the, the researchers and see that that checklist has been properly addressed. And, uh, how quickly you will get your results will also depend on how quickly you reply to the ethics review committee's comments because sometimes we have people who wait for months before com uh, commenting or before submitting their protocols back to us and that's going to take time now one of the important things for any researcher to understand is that you do not have to agree to everything that the erc asks for the ethics review committee is that's giving you an opinion and it's up to you to accept it or reject. So if you are rejecting it, give your reasons. And if those are valid reasons, the ethics review committee will accept that their comments were, you know, not appropriate for that particular study or that they could disregard those comments. So you don't need to agree to everything that the ERC asks. So in the ethics review, the ethics committee will look at not only the science, which is what I mentioned earlier, but the ethical issues as well. And we will be looking at how the participants are protected and how are their rights and their well-being being addressed. So it's very important to look at the risks involved in the study, look at the benefits that the person might be expected to get and see whether the risk-benefit ratio is favorable particularly if there are risks involved, and we see it very much with clinical trials because there are interventions. And in those instances, how has the researcher looked at minimizing these risks is also something that the ethics review committee will be looking at. So in addition to what the researcher says, ethics review committee will be doing an independent analysis of all these issues, risks versus benefits, confidentiality and privacy. How are you going to maintain the confidentiality of the data that you collect? How are you going to maintain the privacy of the people if you are investigating, if you are interviewing them? You sit in the middle of a clinic where everybody else can hear. So how are you going to minimize those things? Or when you get their data, who has access to those data? Because that's a very key important thing today. Then of course, if biological samples are put, uh, collected, what is going to happen to them at the end of the study? Uh, then the most, in, one of the more important things is the informed consent forms. Uh, the content in, so informed consent form, there are two key aspects that the researchers should be aware of. One is the content. Now the content basically should tell these people, uh, will, should give them enough information as to make a decision as to whether they want to be part of that study or not. It's up to them. I mean, there could be risks, there could be huge amount of risk, but it's up to the individual to decide whether they are willing to take those risks or not. But for them to decide, the researcher should give them adequate information about the study that is being planned. If it is something that we don't know about, we need to tell them that. If there are risks that we know of, then the investigators should tell the researchers, look, these are the risks that you might encounter. 
This is what we are doing to minimize this risk. But of course, because it's research, there are other risks that we cannot think of and that can happen. So the contents should contain about the study, the risks and the benefits that are involved, and also what is expected from the participants. Do they have to come to clinics more than normal? Um, do they have to maintain diaries? Do they have to give extra samples? Do they have to answer telephone calls for data collection? Whatever that is expected of them. And what is what their, what their consent is for all those things. Then the language that we use has to be simple. Not only in the protocol, in the informed consent form also, the language has to be very simple. One of the biggest problems we have is that we have almost perfect English information sheets, but very badly written Sinhala and Tamil information sheets. Now, a translator, a professional translator would use certain words which are not used in the colloquial way. That's not how people understand. it. So it's very important that the translations are checked by the researchers and ask yourself, do I understand what is being said here? So make the language as simple as possible. And when we get the consent from them, there's a separate document, which is called the consent form, not only the content, that's the information sheet is what has the contents of what are going to do and what is expected of them. And the consent form, which is a separate document where the individual says, okay, I'm, I'm agreeable to come into this study. I know the risks involved. These are the risks and I'm happy to take those risks. I know I can move out at any time, even though I have said, yes, this is what is going to happen to my data. And I'm happy for that. This is what is going to happen for my biological samples. I'm okay with it or I'm not okay with it. They have every right to say no. So the informed consent form, remember, has two forms. That is the information sheet and the consent form. So the ethics committee will look at all these aspects independently, irrespective of what the researcher has said and will give you a feedback on that. So if you have addressed those issues properly and very carefully, then there is the delay is very minimal. So in the protocol, address all these issues, the beneficence, the non-maleficence, autonomy and justice, vulnerability. Are these people vulnerable? Are they vulnerable because they are minors or is it because they are not able to protect their rights? Is it because they have a very rare disease and they are very vulnerable because they can't get any treatment? Are they vulnerable because they are our uh, patients or if it's in the university because they are our students so there is a dependent relationship? All these need to be addressed. Then if you are excluding any ethnic group or including a special group, why are you doing that? Or what's the justification? Because Justice in ethics means that we treat everybody in the same way. So if you're excluding them or including a special group, the protocol, there has to be a, the justification for doing that. And as I said, how, what is going to happen to the data collector? So it's important we look at all the benefits and the harms and then see how best the risks are minimized and how best the benefits can be maximized. So these are my last few slides. What are the do's? Ensure that the application is complete. I cannot stress it enough. And most of the time, the applications are returned because they are not complete. So check what the ethics review committee wants. Check their um, checklist and see whether you have completed everything as required. If you think that checklist is not relevant, a particular item is not relevant for your study, Tell them why you think it's not relevant and you're not submitting, because that makes things easier. If you're not sure, talk to that ERC. That's absolutely fine. Uh, you can always do that. You can call the secretary of that ERC. And then sometimes when the comments go back, the ethics review committee will identify a particular person for you to contact if necessary. Use those facilities, because that's how you can minimize the delay. Submit complete documents. Ethics Review Committee is not going to do corrections. They will accept what is given. And I think Poojita mentioned it. You need to write very clearly what is in your mind because we have no way of knowing what you basically are thinking. Meet deadlines. If they say submit before a particular date, submit because that ensures that the documents will be taken up to the next review meeting. Otherwise, it will be another delay. 
do not assume anything um, because you know we get protocols saying everybody who has diabetes will be taken in but you can't assume that the ethics review committee knows what diagnostic criteria you're going to use to define these diabetics are they people who are already on medicines are they people who are you are going to do certain tests and then select those so don't assume write everything that you want to write in that protocol bear in mind that ethics review committee has non-medical people as well and it's very important that, uh, that you basically address those issues as well and from an ERC's perspective, if it is not written, it is not known and not, will not be done. So then obviously it's going to get rejected. So it's very important that you write everything clearly for the ERCs. So in summary, uh, Madam Chairpersons, what I have done is take, you, take the participants very briefly through why we need ethics in research and give a very brief idea about how to select the appropriate ethics review committee you will need to do a lot of shopping to find the best ethics review committee for your protocol uh, i discussed what is needed from the applicant and showed them what the ethics review committee will do so that you get an idea of what happens on the other side so once you know what the ethics review committee do uh, it's very easy to prepare your application uh, in, a, in a manner where the uh, delays uh, can be minimized. So um, that's all I have, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions if there are. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chandani. Chaturi, go on. Uh, Madam, there are some uh, questions. Uh, yeah, Chaturi. What kind of surveys need ethical approval, and what are the ones which should not get ethical approval? Okay, um, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. If you do surveys, it depends on the type of data that you select. And also, um, uh, uh, the, so because of that, it's very difficult to give a, you know, a broad answer to cover everything. So I would say the best possible way, because that will help you when it goes for publications also, because the, the publisher will also, the journal will want to know whether you got ethics approval for your study. So the easiest way is to submit your protocol to the ethics review committee. They will look at the type of data that you're collecting in that survey and decide whether it needs ethics review or not. So if it doesn't review, need a review, then uh, the ethics review committee will give you what is called uh, an exemption letter, which says it has looked at it and it doesn't need any ethics. But um, as a broad rule, sometimes uh, secondary data, if that is what you are surveying, you might not need ethics approval, but the best way would be to uh, basically get the ethics review committee's opinion on that. There's an, thank you, Madam, and there's another question. Uh, do we need to get ethical clearance for retrospective cohort studies? Retrospective cohort studies. Um, see, ethics is always a prospective thing because you can't protect anybody's uh, rights or well-beings in a retrospective manner. So if you are planning a study, uh, yes, you need to get it. But a retrospective cohort study, again, it will depend on the study that you are going to do and uh, what you are planning to do. So again, my answer would be send it to the ethics review committee so that uh, they can decide whether you need ethics or not. There are more questions coming in, Madam. I'll quickly share with you uh, the difference between be beneficence and non maleficence. Okay, so beneficence is obviously benefit. So if you take part in a research uh, for the participants, what is the benefit? So are they getting a particular test drug for which there is some evidence to say that it is better than what is already being there? Um, are they getting some sort of a, a you know uh, an outcome which would not be available otherwise uh, so particularly when it comes to test drugs in clinical trials that's that could be a benefit because that might be the only way in which you might get a drug which is you know currently not available very widely which has some proven benefit so beneficence is the benefit that they're looking at and that benefit might be there for the individual person, or it could be for the community, nothing for the individual person, but the findings would benefit the community uh, at large, that particular community, the country or the world. So when you look at some of the old studies that were not done in Sri Lanka, 
we are actually benefiting from what was found in those studies. That's why we are using them in practice. So that's beneficence. So non-maleficence is no harm. So if the study actually has no benefit for the, to the individual person, then we must make sure that there is no harm that will come to this particular person because they are coming into this study. So that's the difference between beneficence and non-maleficence. So beneficence is a benefit you might get by looking at that study, uh, by taking part in that study. But uh, non-maleficence is if there is really no benefit to the individual, they are just coming in because the others might benefit. And therefore, we have to make sure that the harm is or the risks are very, very minimal and that it is nothing more than what they would have encountered by just being part of, you know, being getting their normal treatment or the normal follow-up. Do we need to get ethical uh, clearance for brief articles written for journals and for audits? Um, audits, again, it will depend on what you're auditing. Most of the time, the ethics review committee will exempt it. So I'm stressing the fact that that decision must come from the ethics review committee and not really from the investigators. Because if you don't do that, uh, you might come into problems, you might run into problems later on when you publish. And there's nothing you can do. Uh, Chatri, what's the second one? Audits For brief articles. Brief articles? Yeah. But ethics is for, for research. Journal. Uh, so if there's any research that is involved, then yeah, I think you need to uh, get ethics review committee's uh, views and approval. And uh, there's another question. Ethic, uh, what are the ethical issues that should be addressed when doing online interviews for data collection in qualitative studies? So that will probably be another full lecture. I don't think we have enough time to answer that. Um, there are enough guidelines that you can search the web and find out if you like, but I can always share some of them with you. I don't think we have enough time to go through that do we? because that will probably be another full lecture. Um, in terms of clinical researchers, uh, by finding efficacy of herbal medicine, what is the way to get ERC approval? The same way as you get for any other you know, medicine. You send a complete protocol. Uh, so you have to have data on what you know about that herb, particularly herbs, if they are registered in Sri Lanka, then that evidence has to be there. Over and above that, what sort of publications do we have regarding that herb? Most of the herbs have publications now, not in our journals, but in other journals, uh, they, are, they are accepted. So there has to be some information about the herb that is being tested. And of course, the same steps that Pojit outlined in that protocol, you know, everything has to be there. So there's no different uh, way, it's the same process. And the ethics review committee will look at it in the same light. But of course, evaluating herbs will be slightly more different than how we evaluate our normal uh, Western medicines that we normally have most of the time. And uh, psych this is regarding psychological interventions. What extent do, uh, do we have to describe the intervention in the information sheet? Okay, so as I said, the information sheet is given to the study participants to make to make them understand what is expected of them, and so that they can make an informed decision whether to join that study or not. So the intervention, when you describe, it should be in a simple language, telling them this is what we are doing to you, and this is these are the risks involved, uh, and then. Uh, these are the benefits that we hope to achieve. This is what you are expected to do. So in that intervention, all those things should be mentioned to the participants. So the information should be as complete as possible for them to uh, make a decision uh, on whether to decide or not, to join the study or not. And then also, they should also be given time or a contact person to talk to, to find out more information about the study if necessary. Madam, one question. This is from Professor Lama Vadasuriya. How does one prevent members and reviewers from ERC pinching ideas from proposals submitted? Thank you, sir. That's a very good question. I think it all boils down to the integrity of the people who are, you know, involved with reviewing. And that can happen with reviewers from either granting grant bodies, uh, ethics review committees, and so on. So I have really no answer except to say that uh, it depends on the integrity of the people who are reviewing it. 
Yes, sir. Chandani, thank you very much for that very informative session. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, I appreciate your contribution to this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sudarshini. Thank you, Chaturi. Thank you, everyone.